อวิทยาอาวิทยาคำนี้คำนี้เจหินาเจหินาต้องยิ้มตัวอีต้องยิ้มตัวอีท่านได้สิ่งประกอบไปบางเวสิสิบกิบนามสังสิบกรูปาทีจาร The senses, the mind, and the intelligence are the three places of this lust. Through them, lust covers the real knowledge of the living entity and dualism. Report. The enemy has captured different strategic positions in the body of the conditioned soul, and therefore Lord Krishna is giving hints of those places so that one who wants to conquer the enemy may know where he can be found. Mind is the center of all the activities of the senses, and thus, when we hear about sense objects, the mind. Uh, generally becomes a reservoir of all kinds, uh, sorry, of all ideas of sense gratification, and as a result, the mind and the senses become the repositories of lust. Next, the intelligence department becomes the capital of such lustful propensities. Intelligence is the immediate next door neighbor of the spirit soul. Lusty intelligence influences the spirit soul to acquire the false ego and identify itself with matter. And thus, with the mind uh, and senses, the spirit soul becomes addicted to enjoying the material senses and mistakes this as true happiness. This false identification of the spirit soul is very nicely explained in the Shrimad Bhagavatam 10:84:13. Yes, yatma budi kuna peetri dhatu kes vadi kalatrati shu bhame ijadi yat tirta budi sharire na kari chich. Janishu avignesu sa evo go karaha, which means a human being who identifies this body made of three elements with his self, who considers the byproducts of the body to be his kinsmen, who considers the land of birth worshipable, and who goes to the places of pilgrimage simply to take a bath, rather than to meet men of transcendental knowledge there, is to be considered like an ass or a cow. So the translation states that the senses, the mind, and the intelligence are the sleeping places of this lust. Now, the term "this lust" uh, is indicating that this has been the subject matter uh, before this verse, and that's a fact. In this section of Bhagavad Gita, the problem of lust. As our greatest spiritual enemy, it is very clearly explained by the Lord. We can turn back just to review. And turn back a few verses to text number 14 and 41. Okay. Not just a little bit more. Yes, 37. Here in verse 37, Lord Krishna says, "The supreme personality of Godhead said, 'It is lust, <coughs> Arjuna, which is born of contact with the material mode of passion and later transformed into wrath, and which is the all-devouring, sinful enemy of this world. v i d y a n a m i h a m v i r a m v i r a m means the greatest enemy. So this is the greatest enemy of the conditioned soul." It is the problem. There is no other problem. This is it. It has to be solved in this human form of life. So, from this verse we just read, text 37, we learned that lust is a product of passion, the r a j a g u n a and it is very sinful. This passionate mode inspires one because it is the mode of Intense desire. So, therefore, one becomes surcharged with energy to engage in sinful activities. Sinful activities means activities which are not appropriate for the human form of life, which cause the soul to degrade in the next birth <coughs> below the human form. So, therefore, because it is so passionate. And sinful, it is dangerous. Very, very dangerous, as we see uh, in the history of 
uh, a great Vaishnava saint, Bilva Mangala Thakur. So the story of his life is very exemplary in many ways. And in the early part of the story, we see the example of the danger of falling victim to lusty desire. Uh, this Bilva Mangala, he was uh, a highly qualified Brahmin. Actually, he was so qualified that he even attained Brahma realization. That means he understood early in his youth, because he was so learned, that he was not the body. He didn't have a positive, very positive understanding, other than that he's eternal soul. He didn't know the function of the soul as servant of Krishna. He was an impersonal. But still, that is a very high standard of the spiritual understanding. Unfortunately, you see, in this impersonal state, one may be realized that he's not the body, but he has no engagement for the senses, and the senses are very powerful. So Vilmalamanga was dragged down from this high state of spiritual understanding by the association of one loose woman, prostitute, named Chintamin. And he became so addicted to the association of this woman that he squandered his family's wealth. He, he came from a very aristocratic Brahmin family. But he squandered his father's wealth, spent it all on this woman. He even mortgaged his father's house, lost the title to his father's house, to give money to this woman. Until practically the whole family was poverty stricken. And then the father, in great grief, father became very distraught at seeing how his son had squandered the wealth, yes, but worse, ruined the family name because he was not secret in his affairs with this woman. The whole town knew what Dhuva Mangala was up to. And everyone was talking, and it was a big, big scandal. But Gilda Manga didn't care. This is the mode of passion. Mode of passion means, as I said, the senses of the mind become energized. And one is ready to do anything and everything to satisfy his desire. So this Gilda Manga did. And it came to the point where his father became so grief stricken that he died. And so in Orthodox Brahmin family, the son should perform the funeral ceremony. So the father's body was brought in procession by the grieving relatives and brought to the, what is called the Shmashana, the burning ground. But Bilbo Mangala, he was hanging in the back. He should have been at the head of the procession, but he was in the back. And he was looking very distracted. He was looking around at the, uh, his relatives and seeing if they were watching him. And when he saw that they weren't watching him very closely, he would start to move away. And then someone would say, where are you going? And then he would come back. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone started watching him more. What is he up to? He probably wants to go see Chintamani. How is this possible? His father just died at the funeral. So the, his aunt was berating him. You're such a rascal. This is your religious duty to perform this final ceremony for your father, that his soul will be promoted at least to a higher next birth, if not back to Vaikuntha. This is your responsibility. And what are you doing? You're thinking of sex with this woman. And Bilbo Manga, because it was a fact, he was thinking of the pleasures of the body so he was so disturbed to be in this horrible place, this burning ground. The burning ground in India. Uh, one can see, you know, half burned bodies and piles of ashes where bodies were. It's a very, uh, but actually this is uh, very culture. <laughs> Instead of putting the dead body in a nice box, <laughs> decorating it, with all kinds of makeup, taking the fluids out so that it won't swell up and stink, and dressing it up with a nice smoking jacket, <laughs> and then decorating with flowers and putting in a nice box, 
and closing the door of the box and putting it in the ground. In the Vedic culture, they show you very clearly what the body is all about. As the body is being burned, at one point the head must be crushed with a sharp blow of a big stick to make sure that the soul, the soul might be hiding in the skull. So they smash the skull and the brains come spilling out all over the place. <laughs> this the relatives have to watch. So everyone gets a lesson. So Bill Bolunga, he was, he was very unwilling, he was very, uh, felt very uncomfortable in that situation. So uh, the priest was there, everything was ready, the ceremony must start, and Bill Bolunga, he suddenly he just, as they say, flipped out. He just <laughs> started shouting, I can't do this! No! And his relatives were trying to reason, but this is your duty. It will be a horrible sin. You've already done so many sins. How can you do this sin? In the Kula Dharma, in the religion of the family, there is no greater sin than this. Your father is waiting for you send his soul off and you want to run off and have illicit sex. And that's what he did. He just ran off. So this is the example. How this passionate, lusty desire is so overwhelming that even in the uh, association of friends and relatives who are giving one good counsel, don't do this, one still does it. And of course, the story goes on that uh, as he was running off, a storm broke. And so when he got uh, to, there was one river that he had to cross. When he got to that river, it was already raging torrents. And the river was over flooded. And the boatman that was normally there was not there. Because you don't fly a boat in the middle of a thunder shower. So he was so anxious to cross this river, but it was very dangerous, floodwaters. So he was looking, he thought, he looked and he thought he saw a boatman. So he thought some boatman is sleeping in the rain, that's very unusual, but anyway, <laughs> get up, get up! Then he, oh, this is a dead body. Ah, but dead bodies float. This is the way I'll get across to see my chintan. So he used the dead body as a lock <laughs> and swam across. <laughs> and then when he got to the other side, he ran through the forest, slipping and sliding and bumping into trees, and he came to the great wall of Chintamani's house. And because the storm was so ferocious, thunder and lightning and rain uh, pouring down constantly. So although he was banging on the front gate and shouting, Chintamani, my beloved, she here. So he was going around looking for some way to climb the wall. And he saw what he thought was a vine. But actually it was a big cobra snake which had uh, sort of squirmed up the wall because there was a hole in the wall. So it wanted to escape from the rain by going into the hole. So it had its head stuck in the hole. And the snake, when it's trying to enter a hole, if you pull on its body, it will not come up. <laughs> so he, he was tugging off, this is a strong mind, so he was climbing up, <laughs> deadly over his thing. And only when he reached the top of the wall, here where the hole was, he understood, oh, this is a snake. <laughs> but no matter. <laughs> and then he jumped over the high wall and crashed into the courtyard, <laughs> injuring himself. So he was, you can just imagine, he was covered with filth, covered with uh, the ooze of a dead body that he'd been embracing. He was, his clothes were uh, torn and he was bloody from that fall. And Chintamani, she was in her sitting room and her servant was just lighting the candles. And suddenly, in through the window, falls Bilbo Mangalore. 
comes crashing in through the window. She told me. I love you. And she not only said, who's there? Because it was dark. Who's there? He said, it's your, it's your one and only. And she said, Sudhir? Is that you? <laughs> or Raj? <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, you. <laughs> you don't even have any money. You gave everything. You don't have any money. What are you doing here? What are you doing here tonight? And so he told the story. And then actually, Chintamani, then she actually revealed her real identity. She was actually, uh, she became the, we can put it this way, she became the vehicle through which his spiritual master from his previous life spoke. After hearing the whole adventure, then the spiritual master spoke through Chintamani's mouth saying, if you apply yourself in battle with this determination, you would be a conqueror, you would be a great king, a hero. And if you, with this same determination, apply yourself to serving Krishna, you would be a famous saint. But because you apply yourself in this nasty, lusty business, you are nothing but an ass. The biggest pool of all. So that shook the Vulamanga away. He then understood the purpose of his life. He sought out shelter at the lotus feet of the great spiritual master in his own year and received from him instructions in Krishna consciousness. And then he went on to Vrindavan to become a great saint. But we see in this a very nice, very instructive history the illustration of the degrading danger of lust. And then, the next verse, just reviewing, text 38, we learn, as fire is covered by smoke, as the mirror is covered by dust, or as the embryo is covered by the womb, the living entity is similarly covered by different degrees of this lust. So, yes, lust covers our consciousness, and there are three levels of covering. Three examples of first uh, fire covered by smoke. That represents the covering in the human form of life. Srila Prabhupada said that Krishna consciousness begins with human birth. Just by receiving a human body, one is blessed with some conception of my being a person, of course. For most people, that is a materialistic conception. They identify with personality, with the, the personality with the body, which is a mistake. But nonetheless, there is some idea of personality and some idea of duty, human duty. And some idea of God is there, whether it is accepted or rejected. Even the atheists, they have an idea of God. They reject it, but there is an idea of God. This all comes with the human birth. So Krishna consciousness begins with that. But uh, when one is not careful to apply himself to the purpose of human life, then that human life is compared to a smoky fire. The fire is there. Fire means fire of Krishna consciousness. It is there. But when one does not take care of the fire, uh, then it becomes very smoky. The fire goes down and the smoke becomes very strong and blinding. So in the human form of life, lust is compared to that sort of covering. Then that will lead to a degraded state. One does not control lust in the human form of life. So then there are two lower states. Uh, one example is a mirror covered by dust. So when a mirror is covered by dust, then you cannot see anything in it. And that is uh, compared to animal form of life. Animals are covered completely by lust. But they can still move about. 
Even worse than that is the example of embryo covered by womb, which refers to the uh, plant species, trees and plants. They are so covered by lust that they cannot move. That is, that is a reaction for extremely sinful activities in the human form. The example we have from Krishna book of Nala Kubera and Manjrita is instructed in this connection. <coughs> they were sons of Kubera who uh, one day went to enjoy in the pleasure gardens of heaven. There are certain gardens reserved for lusty demigods. <laughs> so they went there with some apsaras or society women who were in heaven just for that purpose. And they were drinking heavenly intoxicating beverages and enjoying very freely with these girls and when Narada the great sage happened to pass by they were so intoxicated and so lusty that they didn't bother even to cover themselves properly. So seeing these two fools standing naked before him, Narada said, so you're fond of standing naked so you become a tree I curse you to become a tree in your next life. So, of course, the great soul Narayana's curse is actually a blessing. They were cursed to become twin Arjuna trees in Vandava, who after a hundred celestial years were delivered by Krishna. And they resumed their former form as demigods and became pure devotees of the Lord. So that was actually a blessing for them. But here is the instruction that if one uh, falls completely down in this human form of life under the sway of lust. Uh, as we have seen, there's some, just like you mentioned this garden in heaven, so I re recall in Germany, in Munich, there was one, there's one famous English, Englisher garden. And in the summer, such pastimes are going on in front of the public eye. And one summer, one girl uh, left the English garden and got on the streetcar, not wearing a stitch of clothing, and went home in that condition. So these things go on, and there will be a very severe penalty. Of course, people are thinking this is fun, nice way to spend one's youth. But there are many trees standing in the English garden. <laughs> so they will have the opportunity in the next life to be among them and stand naked very nicely for as long as they like. <laughs> so, this is a very unfortunate position for the spirit soul to fall into, but that is, yes, the danger of lust. Then, next verse, text 39, thus the wise living entity's pure consciousness becomes covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust which is never satisfied and which burns like fire. So the consciousness, which is the symptom of our real self, the soul, becomes uh, perverted and obsessed by this lust. And as Prabhupada explains in the purport that actually this so-called happiness that one experiences from this perversion and obsession of the consciousness. There is a kind of happiness that well, people are mad to enjoy these bodily pleasures. But this kind of happiness is actually the source of all suffering. Uh, as is explained, this, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, in the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, about contact of the senses with the sense objects. Nateshu uh, Avate Buddha, that is the last line. Anyway, Matri Sparsha, no, Shito. No. What is that again? Yeah, Dukkha Yoni. Dukkha Yoni. Dukkha means suffering, Yoni means source. So this uh, uh, Sparsha, 
this contact of the senses with the sense objects in Hoga for the purpose of enjoying them. Although it is done in the name of pleasure, the result is dukkha, pain, suffering. So that which is taken in this world to be happiness, to be bliss, is actually the greatest pain, the greatest unending suffering of the soul bound up in this temporary cage of flesh and bones. So Prabhupada gives an example to illustrate how, just like uh, the consciousness is covered, uh, obsessed, perverted by lust, unless one follows the ways of lust, very happily, but in this way one becomes a fool. One who accepts this type of happiness is just a fool. So there's a term, uh, baka under nyaya, which uh, baka means a duck, or a kind of, uh, actually not exactly a duck, it's one of these storks or cranes, small version they have in India, long beak and long neck and high legs. And they're fond of eating fish. So sometimes it is seen this kind of bird is standing in a field, a pasture, where there are cows and bulls. So one wonders, why is this kind of bird, which belongs in the marshy land, uh, where there are fish, why is he out there? And then one sees this kind of bird, Baka, he's following behind the bull. The bull is walking, this bird is walking behind. And sometimes the bird is looking up on the back side of the bull, and he's walking behind. The bull stops, the bird stops, and looks up. <laughs> so the bull has these great testicles hanging down from the back. The duck, this bird, thinks it's a fish. <laughs> this is called in India, Bakka Andanyaya. The Bakka is so foolish, he thinks there's a fish, and the fish will drop. All I have to do is walk behind. <laughs> so all day, they walk behind, waiting for the fish. Therefore, in India, foolish people are called Bakka, or Boka. This term is used like that. And this is the summary of material existence. One is following behind, like this, following behind Maya, waiting for the fish to drop, <laughs> waiting for happiness to come. This is how the consciousness is perverted and obsessed by an illusion. No fish will drop. <laughs> but they still follow. Life after life after life, following, looking up, where's the fish? So this is, yes, this is the result of the covering of consciousness by lust. So, this now today, uh, in the verse we just read, we learn where this lust is sitting. It is captured the senses, the mind, and the intelligence. So the senses that we can experience very uh, bluntly, very directly, how the senses are drawn to their sense <coughs> objects. Just, there's a natural attraction, like between the magnet and the iron. The eyes, when the eyes see something nice, then the eyes become fixed. Suddenly, it's not your intention, but suddenly the eyes are <laughs> <laughs> jerking your head this way. Something nice to see. The ears hear something nice, then they become focused on that. And so each one of the senses, they have their objects which they consider to be pleasurable, and there's a natural attraction. Now, the mind, Prabhupada writes, we've heard in the report, is the uh, repository of all kinds of ideas of sense gratification which result from the contact of the senses with the sense objects. These impressions go into the mind, and the mind is like an endless spool, like a uh, photographic film on a spool. Snap, 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 snap. And so many pictures are stored on the spool. So the mind is like an endless spool. Not only from this life, but there's so many pictures, but from all of our previous births. We have 
so many impressions of sense gratification from uh, life in higher planets, lower planets, animal species, and so on and so forth. Wherever we were, those impressions are stored in the mind. And although we are not consciously aware of them, they are there in the subconscious and sometimes they surface. Prabhupada gives the example of in a, a marsh or swamp. Uh, one will see the water is placid and still like a mirror, but then suddenly from somewhere underneath some gas is released and it comes and forms a big bubble on the top. There was nothing entering the water from outside. It came from within. So like that, we have so uh, the unlimited pictures of uh, sense gratification stored away. And they surface in our conscious mind. And uh, as, as instinct or as inclinations. And so in this way we combine the impressions which we are perceiving now with other impressions that we remember in our conscious mind. And furthermore, there, are, there is the taste, the, or the inclination, the instinct from previous births. And this, this, is, this is the mental world, to combine all these pictures, you see, in newer and newer ways. This is the fun of those who are on the mental platform, mm -hmm. combining pictures. A good example is uh, artists, artistic people. This is their whole business, just combining colors and pictures and this and that, going out and looking, oh, there's an idea, run it back. <laughs> combined. I met an artist in, in, uh, in Bali, uh, the island of Indonesia, famous place. I was a Chinese boy. So uh, <laughs> that was his whole art. He was a, he was a well-known artist in that place. And so he was showing me some of his paintings, some were done and some were he was still working on. And uh, his paintings there were the theme was always some kind of big, three-dimensional sort of grid pattern, like uh, colored bars, some, some very psychedelic pattern. <laughs> and, and this was his conception of the, the grid of the universe of time and space or something like that. <laughs> and they interspersed in the different spaces between the grid. You'd see a baby, you know, a newborn baby, and then he would say, that's my son. <laughs> he would do a little picture of his son and throw it in his painting. And then somewhere else would be his wife and somewhere else would be his pet cat. <laughs> so, you know, this is the artist. He's going around and wow, yes. Then he runs, adds that, creates something extraordinary. <laughs> and there are some people who are not artists by profession. They're, they're not skillful in that way. But this is going on up here all the time, constantly. <laughs> Just <laughs> and this is the fun in life. <laughs> so this is the the mental <coughs> lust, and of course, one who lives in this type of world, then the lust builds up in the mind and must be released, exercised through the senses, and then the lust is in the intelligence. So, the intelligence in another verse in Bhagavad Gita, the purport actually, is compared to a uh, driver of a chariot. Uh, or in the old days, well, just like now, you have, yes, we can just use the modern example, you have taxi cab. So, um, I don't know about here in Stockholm, probably people are a little more refined, but there are some cities in the world where if you land in the middle of the night in the airport, you go out, you're a stranger in a strange land, and you want to take a taxi somewhere. You have to be very careful with these taxi drivers. They're all out there in front of the airport. And uh, you will give them the address, and they will, yes, I know that place. But uh, they won't take you there, right? They'll take you down some alley, and and drive a little slow and then we'll turn back and start suggesting things. Uh, that, uh, I have some friends who like some drugs, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you like a nice woman? I think you. Just here, just around the corner. What do you think, huh? 
So in this way, uh, and very often, the, if you succumb to such kind of proposal, there won't be drugs, there won't be women, they'll just be knocked on the head and you wake up and there's a point being there, no money. <laughs> so, but anyway, whether that happens or not, but the point is, this kind of driver is a cheater. He's a rascal. You take, you're paying him to take you to the Sheraton Hotel or wherever you want to go. Hare Krishna Temple, we hope. <laughs> But he has other ideas because he's a rascal. So that is a comparison, lusty intelligence. We depend on the intelligence for direction. But when the intelligence, when lust is hiding there, then the intelligence misleads us. Very, very subtly. You don't know, just like when you're in taxi cab. You don't know. You've given the address, you think he's going there. He may not be going from somewhere else, some uh, dirty part of town <laughs> that he's suggesting you like, you like, you can enjoy it, come on. And by that association, one may succumb. So this is, uh, as Shiva Prabhupada explains, in order to combat and defeat this eternal enemy of lust, one must know where he is hiding. In the senses, in the mind, and the intelligence. Then, in the next verse we want to read tonight, text 41, we will hear how one goes about dealing with this lust in these places. Tasma tvam indriyanyado nyanya parakarshava papmana pradihikena jnana vijnana nashana. Therefore, O Arjuna, that's the Bhart is in the very beginning, curve this great symbol of sin lust by regulating the senses and slays destroyer of knowledge and self-realization. Report, the Lord advised Arjuna to regulate the senses from the very beginning so that he could curb the greatest sinful enemy lust which destroys the urge for self-realization and specific knowledge of the self. Jnana refers to knowledge of the self as distinguished from non-self, or in other words, knowledge that the spirit soul is not the body. The jnana refers to a specific knowledge of the spirit soul's constitutional position and his relationship to the supreme soul. It is explained thus in the Srimad Bhagavatam 2.9.31, jnana parava bunyam me the knowledge of the self and the supreme self is very confidential and mysterious, but such knowledge and specific realization can be understood if explained with their various aspects by the Lord Himself. Bhagavad Gita gives us that general and specific knowledge of the self, the living entities or parts and parcels of the Lord, and therefore they are simply meant to serve the Lord. This consciousness is called Krishna consciousness. So, from the very beginning of life, one has to learn this Krishna consciousness, and thereby one must become fully Krishna conscious and act accordingly. Lust is only the perverted reflection of the love of God, which is natural for every living entity. But if one is educated in Krishna consciousness from the very beginning, that natural love of God cannot deteriorate into lust. When love of God deteriorates into lust, it is very difficult to return to the normal condition. Nonetheless, Krishna consciousness is so powerful that even a late beginner can become a lover of God by following the regulatory principles of devotional service. So, from any stage of life or from the time of understanding its urgency, one can begin regulating the senses in Krishna consciousness, devotional service of the Lord, and turn the lust into love of God in the highest perfectional stage of human life. So, Tasmatvam Indriyan Yadav Nyam Nyam Therefore, you Indriyani, the senses, Nyamya, by regulating Ada. Ada means in the beginning. So what is this beginning? This is actually the test of sincerity. That beginning has been explained uh, earlier in the Gita. Jayato Vishaya Bhutam Samvasteshu Pajayate. So uh, lust begins with Jayato. Jayato is a form of the word dhyam. Dhyam means meditate. Meditation. So when one meditates on the objects of the senses, on the pleasures of the material world, sangha teshu jayate. At that point, sangha association is given. So this, this is the adhau. This is adhi, beginning. Beginning of one's entanglement in material life. 
So Lord Krishna says, He is giving everyone a very clear, very easy to understand key to liberate himself. He says, Tasmat At that stage, the stage when the contemplation of the sense objects begins, one must regulate these senses. And then, then one can slay this destroyer of knowledge and self regulation Now what does that mean to regulate the senses specifically? You know this Bhagavad Gita, uh, this is Lord Krishna's instructions to Uddhava, uh, sorry, to Arjuna. And there's another Gita, the Uddhava Gita, just slipped out. Um, which is Lord Krishna's instructions to Uddhava in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. So these two Gitas are very complementary. And you can find in Bhagavad Gita, uh, there are verses which are related. In the Uddhava Gita, there is a definite cross-reference. And because Uddhava Gita is more expanded, it is almost the whole canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. So there are many themes which are touched on in Bhagavad Gita, which in the Uddhava Gita are expanded upon. Where in Bhagavad Gita maybe one, two verses apply to one subject, in Uddhava Gita maybe five or ten verses. So there is more knowledge. It fills out our understanding very nicely of Bhagavad Gita to read it together with the Uddhava Gita. So, uh, Lord Krishna speaks also to Uddhava of how one should regulate the senses in the beginning. And he gives three uh, advices. And the uh, first advice is uh, the word he uses. I think. Anyway, it means to uh, always remember the Lord. Anusmiti, yeah. Anusmiti means fixed remembrance. Smiti means remembrance. Anu means fixed or concentrated. So this is one thing. That one should always remember Krishna. So therefore, yes, when the thoughts of sense gratification try to invade the mind, the remembrance of Krishna is there and these thoughts cannot take hold in the mind. Because you, you cannot help these thoughts passing through. They will pass through. Because the senses receive their impressions, they are automatically pumped into the mind. You can't do anything about it. You can't sever your nerve endings. So <laughs> the mind will not receive these impressions. They must come. But the test of our sincerity, what happens when they enter the mind? So if one immediately lets them go, this is, this is nonsense, this has nothing to do with Krishna, then one is not content. So this is accomplished by always remembering Krishna. Hmm? Another thing, another third, or a second, sorry, second point that Krishna recommends to Uddhava is, and the word is specifically there, Namasankirtan. One should always engage in Sankirtan, chanting the holy name of the Lord in the company of devotees. And then the third thing is to, uh, he says, Yogeshwara Vidhi. One should follow the path laid down by the great masters of yoga, that means Bhakti Yoga, the great devotees of the Lord have laid down a path of yama and niyam, of do's and don'ts, that term. Niyam Bharatarsha, Niyam, Niyam Niyam. So that means accepting a regulated lifestyle. Do's and don'ts, four regulated principles. No meat, meat, no eating meat, no eating fish, eggs, no intoxication, no gambling, no illicit sex. Uh, rising early, engaging the senses always, and serving Krishna. This is Niyam and Niyam. So these three recommendations for Krishna makes in the Buddha Gita. To keep Krishna in the mind, somehow or other, the best way is to always chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 R
develop a relationship, an intimate, loving relationship with the deity through practical emotional service so that one will always remember, He is my Lord. When the deity appears in the heart, then there is no question anymore of this attraction to materialistic sense objects. So always remember Krishna, engage in Krishna Kirtan, and follow the rules and regulations. In this way one can curb the sinful enemy of the whole world, lust, in the very beginning, avoid.